a warm Green Festival welcome for John Perkins. Thank you, Denise, very much. Thank you, all of you. Um, thank you, Seattle, my new home. I just moved a little less than a year ago over to Bainbridge Island. So my, my daughter has a local organic restaurant over there called Local Harvest. Come visit us. Anyway, <laughs> it's great to be here. I love living in Seattle and what an amazing community. And it's wonderful to be here uh, talking with all of you today. And thank you, David Corton, for that amazing, powerful, beautiful, eloquent uh, presentation on our economy and how we have to change it. That was a truly beautiful. David probably can't hear me. He's back here. But let's all give David another hand. Hey, <laughs> David's one of the reasons that I moved here. David and Fran, his wife, who is the publisher of Yes Magazine. And uh, this community is amazing. And what I want to say is I as I look out at you today um, is, you know, you, I, all of us have been born into the most amazing time in human history. We are incredibly fortunate to be here at this time. It's a time that's been prophesized by every indigenous culture that I've ever worked with on this planet. And I've worked with indigenous cultures on every continent where they live. They don't live on Antarctica and I haven't worked there. But every single indigenous culture that I've lived and worked with over the last almost 50 years has a prophecy that says that you were born into one of the most amazing times, perhaps the most amazing time ever so far in human history. This is a time of the prophecies. And every one of these prophecies says that we are at a time now where we have the opportunity to transition into a higher form of consciousness, to wake up, to really understand the world that we live in, to create a sustainable, just, and peaceful world for all of us. You were born in that time. You're extremely lucky. We all are. Every indigenous culture that I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot of them over these years, tells us that you come into this life, in this body that you inhabit, to the parents that you were born to, because you have a mission. Now, in our culture, we don't usually look at missions. We look at goals. You know, your goal is to get good grades, go to a good college, find a good spouse, have a good kid, make sure the good kid gets good grades, you have a good job, the good kid finds a good spouse, goes to a good school, da-da-da-da. Goals. Indigenous cultures tell you you have a mission and you spend a great deal of your life exploring that mission and how to realize it. We don't do that in our culture. We need to. And so feel that. Feel your mission. You came in with a mission and you came in at this time which has been prophesized as a time for raising consciousness. When Denise introduced me, she mentioned my grandson, Grant, three and a half. He lives right across the pond here over on Bainbridge Island, as do I. And whenever I take him for walks in the woods, which is often, I think about what is this world going to look like in six decades when he's my age? And we all know that if we stay this course, it's going to be ugly. But we have the opportunity to change it. And we're in the process of this now. What's been going on in Latin America for the last 10 years, a democratic revolution that's sweeping that continent. What's going on today in the Middle East, another attempt at revolution. We don't know the outcome yet. It's phenomenal. What's going on in this country is with teachers and government workers and others, students who are standing up to the system. We all feel it. Don't you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Are you ready for this revolution? We are in a period of revolution, and it falls on each of us to realize our mission. And, and Fran, David Corton's wife, and the publisher of wonderful Yes Magazine is going to be wandering around handing out, as she did last time, sign-up uh, slips for Yes Magazine. I, you know, I, 
encourage you all to subscribe. There's a Friday afternoon edition that comes out. This last Friday, yesterday's was phenomenal. A great, great edition. And also on there is a little card for my daughter and son-in-law's magnificent restaurant in Bainbridge, local organic food. Take one of those and come visit. Anyway, here we are at this incredible time in human history. And these prophecies are rampant. Every single indigenous culture I know has a prophecy. They're all different, but they're all saying the same basic thing, that we have arrived at a time with the potential for tremendous transformation, and we all know we need it. Now, probably the most well-known prophecy at this point is the prophecy of 2012, the Mayan prophecy from Central America. And I spend a lot of time with Mayan shamans and elders. I lead trips with my co-facilitator, Lynn Roberts, to the Mayans every December. And love to have some of you join us this coming December. You can go to my website, johnperkins.org, subscribe to my website, subscribe to my newsletter that comes out twice a month, and come, come to Guatemala with the shamans. But this prophecy of 2012, they all tell us, contrary to what Hollywood has said, that we are entering a time with a tr tremendous potential for creating a better world, a world that's truly sustainable, just, and peaceful. And uh, having my, this three-and-a-half-year-old grandson, I have to recognize that for the first time in human history, I can't create a better world for him simply by doing it here in the Seattle area or the United States. It has to involve every child on the planet. The only way my grandson or your children or grandchildren are going to possibly have a sane, just, peaceful world that's thriving for everyone is if everybody has it. And this is the first time in human history. It's the first time that every human being on this planet, in fact, every sentient being on this planet, is being impacted by the same crises used to be that Florida had hurricanes and Japan had tsunamis and they didn't really impact each other that much. But today, every single one of us is impacted by global climate change. Regardless of what you think causes it, it's happening. The glaciers are melting, the oceans are rising, climate's changing. Every single sentient being on this planet is impacted by resources that are diminishing at increasing rates and prices of food, fuel, and other essentials that are increasing at increasing rates, by overpopulation, by species extinction. We're all in this together. It's never been this way before. We're all in this together. We're realizing for the first time that we truly live on a tiny, fragile space station. But unlike the space station our astronauts built, this one doesn't have any shuttles. You can't get off it. Neither can I. We've got to fix it. Are you ready to fix it? Are you ready to fix it? Well, you have to do it. We have to do this thing together. Obama's not going to do it. McCain couldn't have done it. Sarah Palin, she might be able to do it. But I don't think so. We have to do it. You have to do it. I have to do it. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few moments. But I want to get a little bit more into this prophecy. The other interesting thing about this point in time in history is that for the first time in human existence, we are all talking to each other. Cell phones, internet, streaming. I was on a radio show yesterday, a TV show. I was Skyping into a, a small station in Finland. And we were getting text questions coming in from places like Botswana in Indonesia, a small Finland station. I'm on Skype on Bainbridge Island, and I'm getting questions from all over the world. This is amazing. We're all talking to each other. Never happened before. So these prophecies are telling us that about this time, the prophecy of 2012, Hollywood likes to talk of it as, as a doomsday prophecy. It isn't. It comes directly out of the Popol Vuh, the most sacred text of the Mayan people who live in Central America. And it tells us the story of 
this, this, old, this kingdom, this king whose name was Seven Macaw. And he was a very violent, exploitative, vicious king, selfish, ego-driven king. And the hero twins came along, and incidentally, Seven Macaw represents the old paradigm. In fact, what we've been living in and what we're still just moving out of. And then along come the hero twins, us. The hero twins represent us. And they sever the head of Seven Macaw and replace him with one Hunapu, a new leader who's characterized by compassion, by selflessness, by love, by cooperation. And so what this prophecy has said that on, in 2012, this will happen. But the prophecy actually says it's over a period of time. So how do we get the date of December 21st, 2012? That's the date. And what that date really represents is the time when from the Mayan perspective in, in, in the pyramids in the Yucatan Peninsula, the Patan of Guatemala, if you're in those pyramids and you look at the sun, at that date it enters the very center of the Milky Way, the Great Rift, the equator of the Milky Way. And there's ball courts that are built in all the great ruins of the Mayan people. And most of the major ball courts have a a stone seat where the shaman sat to watch the ball game. And if you sit in that stone seat and you look right down that ball court at the very center of the end, that's where the sun will rise on, 20, on December 21st, 2012. So for over 2,000 years, the Mayans foresaw this time coming. But the shamans will tell you with a twinkle in their eyes, there's some very powerful women shamans we work with. If you go on the trip, you'll meet and, and, and men shamans. And they have a twinkle in their eye and they say, but if you sat on that seat four years ago or five years after 2012, it would still look just like the sun's rising on that spot because the sun's quite large. And in fact, Mathematically, it, that is the spot it rises on in December 21st, 2012. The Mayans were very accurate. But they say, there's nothing about that day. It's like people predicted something radical was going to happen on December 21st, January 1st, 2000. You know, the computers were all going to crash. Nothing very spectacular happened. But a hell of a lot's happened since, hasn't it? The world's changed since 2000. We are in the period that the Mayans say, this is the time. We've been in it for a few years. We'll continue in it after 2012. That's just a marker. But it's the time when we, the people, we, the hero twins, can sever the head of the old regime of egoism, selfishness, exploitation, and replace that regime with one of compassion, cooperation, love, rising to a new level. And one of the other prophecies that I really love is the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. How many people here know the prophecy of the eagle and the condor? How many people here are members of Pachamama Alliance? Basically kind of the same people. We're going to be talking a little bit about Pachamama Alliance in a minute, but the prophecy of the eagle and the condor, which comes out of the Amazon, up through the Andes, moved up to the Hopi people, the Navajo, moved all through North America, it was probably first expressed about 3,000 years ago. Nobody really knows for sure. But this prophecy says, as it was expressed roughly 3,000 years ago, it says back in the midst of history, long before 3,000 years ago, human societies decided to take two different paths. One was the path of the condor, the path of the heart, the path of emotions, of passion. We might even call it the feminine path. And the other part of human society would take the path of the eagle, the path of the mind, the brain, science, industry, might call that the male path. These two sectors of society would divide and go their separate directions. And then in the fourth Pachacuti, in a Pachacuti in Quechua, the language of the Andes is a 500 year interval. The fourth Pachacuti, which would begin in about 1500, would see the two coming back together, the eagle and the condor coming together and clashing. And the eagle would be so powerful that it would practically drive the condor into extinction. And of course, we know that's what happened. 1492, Columbus, a clash of the industrial powers, the scientific, the whatever, the enlightened, 
powers against the indigenous one nearly drove the indigenous heart-based cultures into extinction, but not quite. And so the prophecy goes on to say that in the fourth Pachacuti, 500 years later, year 2000 more or less, the two would have the opportunity, the eagle and the condor, to fly in one sky, to soar, to dance, to mate, to create a new bird, the Quetzalcoatl, a bird of Central America, the Mayan bird. And that this new bird represents a whole new consciousness when male and female come together, science and, and passion come together, the rational and the passion, all these coming together to create a new species in essence, a new us, a new consciousness. We may look the same, we may not, but it's a new consciousness. And every one of these prophecies says, not that it will happen, but that the opportunity is here and what? You have to make it happen. Are you ready to do that? Yeah. All right. We're going to do that together. We're going to change this consciousness. And one other prophecy, I mean, there's thousands of these prophecies. Every single indigenous culture I've ever worked with, whether it's the aboriginal people of Australia or the, the Bedouin people of, of Iran, who I used to live with out on the deserts, or Egypt or Indonesia, wherever, every one of them has a prophecy that's similar to this. There's the Christian prophecy of 2000. There's the prophecy of the age of Aquarius. I mean, you can go on and on and on. One other one that I like is the Himalayan prophecy. The Himalayan prophecy says the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, will be the last. The one we have today is the 14th. So I happen to have the unusual good fortune one day. I was leading a group of about 30 people for dream change from one of the nonprofits I founded in Ladakh, which is, used to be part of Tibet as an Indian protectorate, northern India. Early in the morning, the 30 of us were in the airport waiting to take a flight into Jammu, India. And as we're sitting there in the airport early in the morning, the Dalai Lama walks in with his entourage of people in the same airport. He's going to be on the same flight. He happens to be carrying my book, Shape Shifting. <laughs> so one of the people in our group goes up to his secretary and says, did you know the author? Anyway, to make a long story short, the Dalai Lama invites me to sit with him on the airplane in the front seat for this hour-long flight into Jammu, India. And so as we're sitting together there, I say to him, hey, your holiness, did you happen to know that the prophecy says you're the last? And he says, yes. And I said, well, what do you think of that? And he says, well, I don't know for sure, but I think maybe I'm the last one from the Himalayas. Maybe I'm the last Buddhist Dalai Lama. Blew my mind. And then I said to him, well, where do you think the next one might be from? He said, well, that's why I'm reading your book, because I think he might be from, or she might be from the Amazon of the Andes, which is what you write about. And they've been sending lots of emissaries there. And it, but this was all a little confusing to me. And then as a result of this airplane ride, he invited those 33 people in my group and me to come to his house a couple of days later in Dharamsala and hang out with him uh, for a full afternoon in his living room talking to him. So we go to his house and he greets us and then he says, you know, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. Don't become a Buddhist. The world doesn't need any more Buddhists. But do practice the Buddhist principles of compassion love and cooperation. And then I got it. The Dalai Lama saying, you know, we don't need the male hierarchy that exists in the Buddhist realms either. You don't need to understand all those wrathful deities and other deities and Dahana, all the deities. You don't need to know. What you, all you got to do is get the whole new prophecy thing. Compassion, cooperation, love, a sustainable, just, peaceful world, a thriving world for all human beings. That's all you got to do. You got to get that. And that could come from somebody who's never studied Buddhism. That person could be the next Dalai Lama. An amazing concept. And then I also I had this, this funny thought of, imagine it's Easter Sunday, and you're in St. Peter's Square near Rome, and you're standing down there with thousands, millions of people, I don't know how many, and the Pope comes out on his balcony and he looks down at the gathered minions and he says, I just have one thing to say. 
don't become a Catholic. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Maybe he will do it. This Pope who just yesterday talked to the astronauts up in the space station. Maybe he'll do it. In any case, here we are at this time of prophecies. Here you are. We're at this incredible time in human history. We know that what we have created is a failure. It doesn't take a brilliant economist like David Corton or a less brilliant one like me to tell you that in a world where less than half, where less than 5% of the population lives in one country, the United States, less than 5% live here and we consume almost 30% of the world's resources, while roughly half the world is starving or on the verge of starvation, there's no other way to define that except as a failure. It's a failed system. You can't replicate it in India or Africa or Latin America. You need another five planets like this without any human beings living on it to do that. And despite Avatar, that's not going to happen. It's a failed system. And it's up to you to change it. You and me. So let's talk for a moment about this system and how can we change it? What can we do? And you've already heard some amazing remarks by David Corton about things that we need to do uh, to change politics, to change the way that our government regulatory bodies are, are, are set up, et cetera. And I'm going to address it from a little bit different angle. I'm going to look at it from the corporate angle and all the power that we have over corporations because that's where I come from. And so to get to start with, maybe I'll just review a little bit about how I think we got to where we are today because I think I played a pretty major role, not a major role, but I was one of, the, one of the guys in the trenches doing this. I was an economic hitman. What do economic hitmen do to create this world? What have we done? What did we do? Well, we do a lot of things, but perhaps the most generic, the most common, is that we'll identify a third world country with resources our corporations covet. And I suspect if you have, you've heard me say this before, I apologize if I'm repeating to you. So we identify a country with resources that corporations covet like oil. And then we arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. But the money doesn't actually go to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country. Things like power plants and industrial parks that benefit a few wealthy families as well as our own corporations, the major beneficiaries, our own corporations but don't help the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity, can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people. And yet they're left holding this huge debt that they can never repay. So at some point we go back to that country and we say, hey, since you can't pay your debt, sell your, co your, sell your oil or whatever the resource is real cheap to our oil companies without any environmental restrictions without any social demands, without any human rights demands, or vote with us on the next big United Nations vote, or allow us to build a military base on your soil. And in the few cases where we fail, we economic hitmen fail, which doesn't happen often, but in those cases, the jackals go in, and they either overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. So I talk in my books about how I failed with the, with the democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and with Omar Torrijos of Panama. I couldn't corrupt them. I couldn't get them to accept these conditions. And both of them were assassinated as a result uh, by CIA-sponsored jackals. In the few cases where the jackals also fail, like with Saddam Hussein, who had very good security, too many look-alikes, in those cases, the military goes in. So the military is this last resort. But all these world leaders know that the military is there waiting for them. If they don't play the game, they know what can happen. And so this system that we've created, and which has been very, very powerful in the world, has brought us to this point in history where we have a totally failed system. We have a system that my little grandson, Grant, does not want to inherit. 
nor to any of his brothers and sisters anywhere on this planet, nor to you. Do you want the system? <laughs> do you want the system? No. Hell no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got to wake you up one way or another here. Um, actually, you all look very awake. We are waking up. This is the time to wake up. And so what we have today is a new world empire that's run by what I call the corporatocracy. It's not a particular government. It's the big corporations. And it's not a conspiracy. They don't have to get together to conspire to do anything illegal. But today, our presidents, our leaders, are not very powerful. We're seeing that. Obama has some power. He can make some changes. But in general, our leaders are extremely vulnerable. In Kennedy's day, they had to be taken down by bullets. Today, they can be taken down by rumor, innuendo, accusation. We've just seen the head of the IMF brought down by an accusation. It may very well be true. I have no idea. I'm certainly not defending the man. I hate the IMF. I don't particularly like that individual. But it's a little scary to me how quickly a person can be brought out of power uh, by an accusation or an innuendo. We have to understand it could happen to Obama, too. It could have happened to Bush. It could happen to anybody out there. And so the leaders of the world, the political leaders, know that they're in extremely vulnerable positions. The big corporations are calling the shots. And what is Libya about? I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but we attacked Libya primarily, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others, because Libya was, Gaddafi was advocating a new currency for Africa and all the Muslim countries, the gold dinar, uh, that would replace the dollar on the oil markets. Saddam Hussein had, had, uh, had, had been advocating something similar when he was taken over. That, in my opinion, is the reason we went after Gaddafi when we did. And also, to establish a very strong presence, to make a very strong statement in the Middle East where amazing things are happening. Let's face it. There's a popular revolution going on across the Middle East, and the corporatocracy does not like it. And they want, if Mubarak has to be replaced, which he will, if Gaddafi has to be replaced, if other leaders have to be replaced, they want to make sure that those leaders will be replaced by people who have the same policies, different faces, different names, but support the corporatocracy, the big corporations, as those other leaders did. And so what's going on in Libya is this amazing show of force, and it's also standing up to a guy whose central bank owned tons, about 150 tons of gold and was a real threat to our central banking system, was a real threat to our currency, the dollar's, the dollar's uh, dominion. But there's this thing going on today that we're seeing that's standing up to this corporatocracy. We've seen it in Latin America where 10 countries representing more than 80 percent of the population of South America, 10 countries voted in presidents that are standing up to the corporations that are saying no more exploitation by corporations. They're different, you know, there's different degrees. Uh, the way Morales is handling it in Bolivia is very different from the way Chavez is handling it in Venezuela or Korea and Ecuador. But they're all standing up to this in their own ways. It's an amazing revolution in Latin America. And every one of these 10 countries, during most of my lifetime, I spent a lot of time in Latin America. I speak Spanish fluently. I have three godchildren there. I go every year, at least once a year, often many times a year. During my lifetime, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador in 1968 for three years. I've been going to Latin America a lot. And every one of these 10 countries during almost all of my lifetime was run by brutal dictators, put into power by the CIA, and kept there by the CIA until the last seven or eight years, when huge underswells of popular movement, democratic movements have replaced these dictators with democratically elected presidents who are standing up to us. And they're having to be very careful also, because they know they can be taken out. Zelaya was taken out, president of Honduras, about a year and a half ago tried to overthrow Correa of Ecuador less than a year ago, but he was smart, he withstood it. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. He knows our system very, very well. He managed to survive. 
So something amazing has been happening in Latin America, and now we're seeing it in the Middle East, we're seeing it in Asia, we're seeing it in China. I just came back from China where there's a huge swelling of undercurrent by the young people to be greener and greener and greener. We're seeing it in the United States. You're feeling it. Are you feeling it? Yes, you are feeling it. We are feeling it. And so what are we going to do about it? You know, the thing is that when you're under an empire that's run by military rule, it's very dangerous and difficult to get rid of them. You probably got to take up arms to get rid of that. We are under a dictatorship. We are under a empire that's run by big corporations. And as I said before, this isn't a conspiracy theory. Most of these corporate executives never even met each other. They don't get together and plot things out. But they're all run by one single goal. It's what fires them. It's a goal that was defined, not established by, but defined by Milton Friedman, the Chicago School of Economics back in the 70s when I was an economic hitman. It was completely embraced by Ronald Reagan, Thatcher, Odson, other leaders in 1980. It's been embraced by every US president since, Democrat and Republican alike. The single goal that drives what I call predatory capitalism, a new form of capitalism, a mutant viral form of capitalism, this goal is maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. Now, when I went to business school in the late 60s, I was taught, we were all taught, it was Keynesian economics, we were taught that a good CEO gets a decent salary, but not a great salary, gets a good rate of return for his investors, but not windfall profits. A good CEO has a responsibility to take care of his employees or her employees while they're employees and afterwards. Pensions. Pensions. What the hell is that? I'm not sure my grandson would understand the word. Takes care of his employees. Takes care of his or her customers. Takes care of the suppliers. And perhaps most of all, takes care of the community where the business is located, is a good citizen. That's all changed. That's no longer the motivating factor. The motivating factor is maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. Two other tenants of Friedman's stated, the way Friedman stated it. The second is don't regulate business. That just gets in the way of making profits. And we all know that business executives have tremendous integrity, are totally honest, and would never do anything to cheat anybody. <laughs> right. Yes. Wall Street has demonstrated that impeccably. Third tenant, privatize everything. Everything should be run by private business. The schools, the jails, even the military, which is what's happening in Afghanistan today. So these three tenets, maximize profits regardless of everything else, social and environmental costs, no rules or regulations for business, and let business run everything. And we've gone a long way in this direction. And it's brought us to this world today, this system, predatory capitalism, which is a failure. There's just no other way to define it for us. It's not a failure for the people at the top. It's a, it's a feudal system, and we're the serfs. You and I are the serfs. We're all the serfs around the world. Do you want to be a serf? Are you going to rise up and stop being a serf? Good. Let's see. We've got to think of some new words besides no and yes here today. <laughs> now. 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 <laughs> so what can we do? I think, you know, David Corton has amazing ideas about how we have to change government and so on, and I totally agree with him on every one of those. But also, having been in the corporate world for so long, what I recognize is that government is controlled by the big corporations. So we're probably not going to be very successful at changing rules and regulations unless we get the corporations to go along with us. How are we going to do that? Well, we have to recognize that the corporations are completely dependent on you to buy their goods and services or your tax money. They're totally dependent on us. Unlike other empires that have enforced their rules through military, they don't do that. 
They are dependent on us. And the marketplace is essentially a democracy if we choose to make it that. Every time you buy something or choose not to, you're casting a vote. And if, frankly, I think that vote is at least as important as, maybe more important than the vote you cast in the ballot box. We have power over these corporations. You know, when I was going to graduate school, when I was going to business school, rather, in Boston, I couldn't walk beside the Charles River because it stank so badly. It was terribly polluted. It's not anymore. You can swim in it, so they say. And apartheid was rampant in South Africa. Not anymore. In both cases, we reined in the corporations. We got them to change things. We got rid of aerosol cans that were destroying the ozone layer. We've, we, we, we convinced them to open their doors wider to you women and to minorities. In recent years, we've gotten them to get rid of trans fats and foods and antibiotics and chickens. We have tremendous power over corporations. It doesn't take many of us. You have the power. You have it. We have to use it. Now we must ratchet this up a notch and let's say, let's create a new goal for corporations. No more maximizing profits regardless of social and environmental costs. If you will only buy from corporations that are totally committed to creating a sustainable, just, and peaceful world and a thriving world for all sentient beings, not just my grandson in this country, but every child on this planet, recognizing that you can't have homeland security until you realize that the entire planet is your homeland. You. Here we are at this time when we have this amazing power to recognize that let's redefine what the corporate goals should be. Let them make profit, let them make a decent rate of return for their investors, but only within the context of creating a sustainable, just, peaceful and thriving world for my grandson Grant, which means for every child on this planet. Let that be the guiding principle. Let corporate interests serve the public interest. And we have a tremendous precedent for this, incidentally. For the first hundred years, the United States was a country. No corporation could get a charter unless it proved it was going to serve the public interest. Charters lasted on average for 10 years, and then the corporation had to go back and reestablish that it had served the public interest and would continue to do so. That all changed in the late 1800s when the Supreme Court decided that corporations had the rights but not the, but not the responsibilities of individuals. I think we need to reintroduce the concept that your corporations, the people you buy from, are there to serve you. They're there to serve a public interest. And to me, that's the only way we're ultimately going to get all the changes that we need, including the ones in government, the regulations. And I'll tell a quick story on that. Woman who was the head of the environmental department for one of the nation's largest utility companies, Florida Power and Light, uh, learned that her company was going to build its first coal-fired plant in Florida. She was totally opposed to it. She went to her boss, the president, and said, I will not permit this plant. And that was her job. And what turned out in the end, she said, you can force my department, my people, to permit it. They can do whatever they want, but I will not do it. She practically lost her job. And incidentally, I know the story well because this woman happens to be my wife, Winifred, who's babysitting for my grandson right now, or else she'd be here. To make a long story short, the people of the state of Florida would not permit this plant anywhere. I think if my wife had tried to get it permitted, she probably would have succeeded. She's very good at her job. But because she didn't, no community would permit this plant. So FPNL did not build a coal plant in Florida. Instead, they are now the largest developer in the United States of wind and solar. And my wife, incidentally, is leading that effort from an environmental standpoint from, her, from our house in Bainbridge. They, they, she got back in good stead with them. Um, but what's really, really interesting about this is that the people of Florida, a pretty damn conservative state, spoke loud and clear. 
and it changed a giant corporation, the nation's third largest utility company, used to always send its CEO to Washington at least once a month to fight against any controls on CO2 emissions. And now, because they've become the largest producer of solar and wind and no longer are looking at doing anything like coal or anything like that, now their CEO goes to Washington at least twice a month and fights for CO2 emission controls. And it's the same CEO. He saw the light. Why did he see the light? Because you, the people, spoke the power that we have. But now we've got a corporation that's fighting to level the playing field to say, we don't want Georgia Power to be able to continue to, 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 to sell electricity that's made from coal and take people away from us. We've got to, get, we've got to put some restrictions on coal. So this is how we have the power. So the question now comes down to what can you do? Each one of you individually, what can you do? And I can't go around and answer for each of you individually because I don't know each of you. But I know that each one of you has passion and you have talents. I don't know what your passion and talents are. I have a passion for writing and hopefully some talent. But I don't know what your passions and talents are, but I know you have them. Follow them, but direct them toward creating a sustainable, just, and peaceful world. Change governments, change corporations, change your buying habits, and let them know. You know, it doesn't do any good just to send an email to Nike and say, I'm not buying your damn sweatshirts, even though I like them because they're made in, uh, your, your t-shirts, because they're made in sweatshops in Indonesia. I'm not buying, you can't, you can't just not buy them. You've got to send them an email and tell them why you're not buying them. And send an email to the company out here that's got, that makes good t-shirts, green t-shirts. Let them know why you're buying theirs. It's what I'm wearing. We gotta send the message and they will change. And then they will start to level the playing field. So you, what do you do? Each and every one of you. I look around, I see a few of you out there that are my generation, 30 and older. I know I look younger than 30, but I really am older. If you're old, if you're, if you're retired, if you're retired, nobody can fire you. Rattle the cage. Go to spend a night in jail, you know? I mean, experience life, get out there. <clears throat> so what can you do? Well, look to your passion, look to your heroes. You know, I, I grew up in rural New Hampshire. I come from over 300 years of Vermont and New Hampshire Yankees, fought in the American Revolution, every major war since. And, uh, and I am so thankful, as a student of the American Revolution, I'm so thankful that Tom Paine never tried to lead armies. And George Washington never tried to write pamphlets. Paine had a passion and talent for pamphlet writing, and Washington had a passion and talent for leading men. Martha Washington had a passion and talent for organizing women to make clothes and bullets for the soldiers at the forefront. Thank God they each took their own individual paths, followed their own individual passions and used their talents, but they were headed toward the same destination. You do that. I don't care whether you're, whether you're a janitor, a carpenter, a teacher, a writer, a housewife, a house husband, retired, what the hell ever you are, you've got passion and talent. Now it's time to take action. We must take action. And let's all take our individual paths and head toward that destination of a sustainable, just, peaceful world, a world my grandson Grant will want to inherit. And when we do that, we'll get there. You have power. You have incredible power. As a kid growing up in New Hampshire, I never had any idea that African Americans had to ride on the back of a bus until Rosa Parks showed me. How many people here have heard of Rosa Parks? Who the hell was Rosa Parks? She's you. She walked to the front of a bus. She did a few other things too. But you can do that. And I had no idea that the DDT, my dad and I were spraying on the mosquitoes in the swamp behind our house to kill mosquitoes, was also killing birds and fish until Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring, 
change the world, start a whole environmental movement. How many people here have heard of Rachel Carson? Who was Rachel Carson? You. Rachel Carson sat down one day in her little house in Pennsylvania and started writing a book. She had no friggin' idea whether it would ever be published or not, much less that it would change the world. You can do that. How many of you out there are teachers? You're the professional teachers. Professional teachers had a huge impact on my life. I'm, I'm running out of time, I'm going to tell a few of those stories, but teachers had a huge impact on my life. I appreciate you teachers so much. But I want to rephrase the question. How many of you are teachers? Everybody, hands up. You are all teachers. You're going to walk out of here today talking to someone. You're teaching. We're teachers. And so here we are come together at this time in history that's been prophesized by every major culture, every indigenous culture on this planet. And you're it. We're at this time with the potential for transformation, shape-shifting. You're it. And so I want to close by reading you a quote, but just to remind you, you've got to do it. We can do it. You have the power. You have the same power that Nelson Mandela had, Mother Teresa, Rachel Carson, Rosa Parks. You have that power. Just use your passion and talent. And I just want to mention a couple of, of organizations that are represented here in the Green Festi Festival before uh, that, that are showing this. There's the Bainbridge Graduate Institute. I, Ali, are you here? Is anybody from BGI? Stand up. You've got a table out there. First, first major college in the United States that gives an MBA, that gave an MBA program in sustainability, and your table's right over there. Go visit. I'm going to be over there after I do a book signing out here with, with you and some of your people. Love to chat with you there. Bainbridge Graduate Institute. Fantastic. And you know Yes Magazine, David Cortman's just here, you've been signing up for that. Their issue yesterday was phenomenal. Talked about, you know, anyway. Sign up, join it. The Pachamama Alliance, which I'm one of the co-founders of back in the early 90s, an amazing organization. They've got a table over here, and there's a talk at four o'clock over here on the green stage, given by Pachamama Alliance about four years ago, Gen Up, Awakening the Dreamer, incredible programs. Pachamama Alliance people, stand up. Woo, Pachamama. All right. So it's an amazing organization that does symposiums here, that does programs here in Seattle. Come learn about them at four and then take one of the Awakening the Dreamer programs, about four hours. There's incredible things, and I, I know I've singled out just a few, but this room is filled with people who are changing the dream, changing the paradigm. So I'm going to end now by reading a quote that comes out of the American Revolution but is so appropriate today, I think. So here we are. We've entered the American Revolution. Uh, people like George Washington and Martha Washington and Hamilton and Jefferson have stuck their head in the noose. They're traitors. They're terrorists. If they lose a revolution, they're going to all be hanged. Sometimes we forget that. They were step against the biggest, most powerful nation in the history of the world at the time, and it was their own country. And now Washington's lost just about every battle he's fought in the first year or so of the war. And he's at Valley Forge. And the Continental Congress is not giving him shoes, socks, blankets. Forget about bullets or ammunition. He's not getting anything. Pretty discouraging. They're in Valley Forge. Tom Paine walks in on the scene. And Tom Paine writes these words, which I think are so relevant today. December 1776, Paine says, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he who stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. A generous parent should say, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. If there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child, my grandchild, may have peace. I love the man, Payne continues, or woman, who can smile in trouble, who can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection. 
by perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious future. By perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious future. And I think it's why we're all here together today, to commit to our perseverance and our fortitude. Are you ready to commit? Yeah. To commit to perseverance and fortitude to commit to following each of our own passions, using our talents, and we're all gonna go our separate paths, some of them may overlap, but we're all gonna head for that same destination of creating a sustainable, just, peaceful, thriving world that my grandson Grant and all the other kids are gonna to wanna to inherit. And I really look forward to going through this process with you, this time of transformation that's been prophesized. Together, we will do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is he absolutely amazing? Let's give it up for John Perkins and his.